Hi, everybody. My name is Jason Klein. I'm the Senior Director of Education Partnerships and Learning Solutions at Northern Illinois University. I forgot to start the recording at the beginning. I was so excited about our, our re-kickoff of the Career Pathways user group. Uh, today's meeting was hosted by myself and most importantly, Heather Lukin uh, from the Illinois State Board of Education CT and Innovation team. Um, Heather, you will see in this recording. So what I'm gonna do right now, this is actually being recorded after the meeting, but you're seeing this first because I forgot to record this part of the meeting. So uh, I wanna give you a quick rundown of, of what you missed at the beginning of the meeting, and then we'll rejoin the rest of the meeting in progress. So um, this was the first meeting of the Career Pathway User Group for this 22-23 school year. Uh, we have currently over 180 members from all across the state of Illinois in all kinds of different roles that are part of the Career Pathways User Group. And today we had over 80 people on the call um, joining us for the meeting. So the agenda for today's meeting was, was this, um, in addition to one very important thing missing from the agenda, it's actually one of the two things we're going to talk about right now at the beginning before we join the meeting in progress, and that is uh, data looking at the actual um, number of students, number of, of students who have earned a pathway endorsement during the first three years of this policy in Illinois. So these are the things we're covering here. Um, Again, we had over 80 people in a wide range of positions from all across the state of Illinois, EFE directors, school district people, folks from other and other organizations. Um, we are partnering with Heather Lucan uh, from the Illinois State Board of Education, CTE and Innovation team. You'll meet Heather momentarily. And over the next couple of months, Bill Rose from our NIU Illinois CTE project team will be taking over leadership on the NIU side for the Career Pathways user group. Um, we do a Jamboard that was set up for this first meeting. We've got some notes in there that we will be responding to in, in the user group. We'll be dropping those in uh, to the user group. And so it's really important that people are part of the user group. Um, you can sign up to be a part of the user group um, through, the, through the ISBCT website or through our website. Um, so here's the purpose. What is a user group? Well, user groups are really common in the IT space, oftentimes around like a particular software product. So for example, in school districts in Illinois, every school district purchases their own local student information system. Three of the, the most popular ones in terms of the amount of users in the state of Illinois are Skyward, Infinite Campus, and PowerSchool. And for each of those systems, there are actually statewide user groups. And these user groups are like email lists. And every single day, literally all year, people post questions and other people in those groups pose answers. And this is just people in those roles working with those systems in school districts, helping one another out. Other people read those questions. They're like, oh, that's a great question. I didn't even know I had that question. Oh, wow, that's how we solved that. We don't need to do that now, but we might need that later, um, whatever. And so those user groups really, really work well because people put questions out there and people then are willing to share answers or people put ideas out there. This is something we're trying. So it's really, really an important part of the user group that people are comfortable sharing ideas. In addition to the, the email component, which is we're using Google Groups to do that. But in addition to the email component of the user group, we have, um, we have the the monthly meetings. And so while today's meeting is mostly Heather and Jason talking, moving forward, uh, we hope these meetings are almost entirely uh, all of you talking to one another as part of the group, sometimes, sometimes with presentations, sometimes a breakout room conversations. Um, but that's the point of getting together each month is, is to share. This time we're meeting because there's a bunch of new information we want to share out with everybody, new legislation we'll be sharing in this meeting. Again, these updated student um, endorsement numbers that I'll be sharing momentarily. So that's that's why we're called the Career Pathways User Group here in Illinois. Do have a couple of quick announcements we threw out. Um, 
We have a, a statewide professional learning calendar for all things CTE of events offered with ISBE. Um, these are almost entirely free events and most of them are after school taking place online. Uh, we are in the midst of a severe substitute teacher shortage. So it's very challenging for school districts, even if, if they can afford to do so, to pull teachers out of the classroom. So primarily doing that. Additionally, we wanna give a shout out to the fact that um, on September 29th, we will be hosting webinars in the morning and after school, um, primarily for teachers and uh, building level administrators to offer their ideas about what CTE standards might look like in the state of Illinois. Um, is the, there was a draft set of standards developed this past winter that are, are a combination of the career pathway technical competencies, the career pathway uh, cross-sector essential employability competencies or the essential skills, and then the ACTE career cluster standards. Uh, they were all put together by career pathway. And so we're looking for additional feedback on that. And then the team at ISBE, the CTE and innovation team will, will take that feedback and chart a course for moving forward in one direction or another with CTE standards in the state. And one final announcement, um, as in partnership with the IACTI statewide conference that will take place this year at the Marriott Bloomington Normal on February 16th and 17th, the Career Connections Conference will be taking place the day before as a pre-conference on February 15th. There will also be an evening event um, that we really hope to engage uh, superintendents, school board members, um, other assistant superintendents, including those in, in um, uh, tangentially related to instructional roles like chief school business officials and uh, human resources leaders. Um, that will be a dinner and keynote. And so really excited uh, about February 15th, 2023, the ISBE Career Connections Conference building community before the IACTI annual conference. So more information will be coming out about that before the end of September, um, including registration. So with that said, we are excited to share some career pathway endorsement data with you. We did share this at the beginning of today's meeting, which you're seeing as the beginning of the video version of this. Um, at this point, 48 school districts in Illinois, from very large to very small in terms of the number of students, and from the northern end of the state to the southern end of the state, um, have had endorsement plans that are approved. And so, um, that is about 10% of the school districts in the state that have high schools in them, meaning secondary or unit school districts. Uh, we also have um, many school districts in the state, not quite half, that are, are elementary districts serving early childhood through eighth grade students. So because the career pathway endorsements is, a, is centered in the high school, um, that's where we get that 10% number. Now, just because they've approved plans doesn't mean they've yet awarded endorsements. They, they're planning ahead, they've gotten their plans approved, they have students matriculating up through those plans and going through the courses and the course sequences, earning early college credit, moving through work-based learning experiences, and eventually earning their endorsements as all those things come together. So looking at the actual number of students who've earned endorsements, Again, the career pathway endorsements, the college and career pathway endorsements have been available for three years now in the state of Illinois. This is the beginning of the fourth year of um, this policy in the state. And until this time, these have been encouraged. These have not been required. We've also, as you may have noticed, uh, worked through and are continuing to work through uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And so uh, there've been a lot of challenges to school districts. And despite those challenges, We've seen huge uh, exponential increases in, um, in the number of endorsements issued each year. So the first year, there were five endorsements issued uh, in one district. The second year, there were last year, the, toward, at the end of the 2020, 2021 year, uh, there were 47 endorsements issued. So there was about a tenfold increase from year one to year two. And in five districts, if I remember right, um, across three career pathways, um, and then in 2022, we, that, that multiplied again by 10, 449 endorsements were issued um, uh, across uh, multiple pathways. And so we had another tenfold increase. And so these numbers keep going up. Those are the number of, of students each year who've earned the endorsement. 
These are how those endorsements break down across the career pathways. So thus far, we've had no endorsements awarded in agriculture, food and natural resources or in arts and communications. Um, I do want to point out that agriculture, food and natural resources is a pathway where endorsement plans have been approved at the district level. So we are likely to see students earning endorsements uh, in that area, either at the end of this current school year, or at the end of the following school year, or in the in the near term. Um, then we now have endorsements that have been issued in 2022 in five of the career pathway areas: uh, finance and business services, health sciences and technology, human and public services, information technology, and manufacturing, engineering, technology, and trades. The bulk of these endorsements have been issued in health sciences and technology and human and public services. That's been true each year. Um, though like this year, manufacturing, engineering, technology and trades was up to 22 uh, students that earned endorsements in that area. Um, so the health sciences and technology endorsements are primarily students moving through uh, programs that have been CNA programs and the human and public services endorsements are primarily have been issued to students who are focused on education within the human and public services. Now that's great because both um, medical professions and education are, are areas of workforce need um, and areas of workforce need where we want to ensure we have enough high quality um, um, individuals to fill uh, the available positions and, and diverse uh, employees in those professions to match the diversity of the communities that they're serving. And so this, this really does serve our communities and the state well, in addition to serving the students, earning those endorsements really, really well as they move through their um, scholastic and career journeys. So really significant increases in endorsements awarded. Um, Again, one of the points we wanna make is if you're watching this video, if you were in the meeting, uh, if you're here today, you are still on the front end of this change process. Um, while we've seen this great uptick, there are still many, many, the majority of school districts in the state, the vast majority that uh, have not yet had an endorsement improved, have not yet had a student earn an endorsement. And so um, that, that will change significantly over the next few years. Um, but right now sitting here in September of 2022, you are on the front end of that process. Um, so with that said, um, we're gonna shift into a, a defining HB 3296 here. And at some point in this conversation is where um, the rest of the meeting takes over. So with that said, um, we do want to talk about HB 3296. Um, and so um, let's do that real quickly. So first of all, this legislation focused on two primary areas, and we're just gonna give you a quick high level overview. Um, it focused on, on the PACE framework and the college and career pathway endorsements. One thing to note is there is an opt out provision. So school boards can, can elect to opt out of the career pathway endorsement requirement. And a really important rulemaking is forthcoming. The rulemaking is going to be great. There's, it's actually a great opportunity to kind of clarify some, some of the frequent questions that have come up over the initial years of uh, the college and career pathway endorsement implementation. So I think the timing for that's really good. And Heather uh, is leading that work. And there will be opportunities for stakeholders to, um, to comment on rules and uh, obviously, this is a group um, um, that that may be able to influence that process and share thoughts and ideas. And so just a quick fun call out the the two students here on the right. Uh, they earned career pathway endorsements this past year in manufacturing, engineering, technology, and trades. And I think this picture was taken um, about a year ago as they were beginning 12th grade. So uh, those are like actual examples of students. Um, who have earned endorsements. So first, the PACE framework. You have this, I'm not going to read this all to you, but a um, couple sections are highlighted that I want to call out. So 
one of the keys here is the PACE framework previously, if you were to go to the ISAC website today and look at the, the base framework that's posted from the agencies on the ISAC website, it runs from eighth grade through 12th grade. Now this is required to go down through middle school. Um, that is actually in line with research that dates back to, to Clinton's first term, to Bill Clinton's first term as president out of the Department of Labor actually that showed that students were making not career pathway the way we were just terming it like different areas of occupations, but um, different kinds of jobs broadly, uh, decisions as early as sixth grade. And frequently, unfortunately, students were deciding what they couldn't do, what they didn't think was available to them um, by the time they were in sixth grade. And so um, really engaging students as early as middle school and even late elementary school is pretty important um, to ensure that students are really able to, to leverage all of their strengths and take advantage of, of the schooling opportunities in front of them to contribute in ways that they'll be really engaged in and that can benefit uh, not only themselves and their families, but also their communities. The second part is people want to know, this is the most frequent question I've gotten asked about this over the summer, is so, so when will there be a new PACE framework or do we have to make up our own? So either or both. Um, so first of all, yes, by next summer, by the middle of next summer, the state agencies are required to put out a new updated framework that runs from sixth grade through 12th grade. And so obviously, as soon as that's out, we will be publicizing that for sure through the Illinois P20 network. I know the agencies will also publicize that. So places to watch for more information about that um, include uh, ISAC email list that you can sign up for on the ISAC website, the Illinois P20 network, um, P20 network newsletter, and I'll ask Rodrigo to drop a link into the chat uh, for, for that uh, newsletter subscription form that is a free newsletter that comes out every other Friday. Uh, our next edition will be out next Friday. Um, and then ISBE, both the weekly newsletter and the CTE newsletter. And if you don't get those ISBE newsletters, you can subscribe to those um, at isbe.net slash subscribe. And I'll ask one of my teammates to drop the link in the chat to that too. So we'll have two links for newsletters. If you wanna receive uh, those, the CTE newsletter comes out uh, regularly. Uh, the goal is monthly, I think there. Um, and uh, the weekly newsletter from ISBE is obviously every week, typically on Tuesdays, but when there's no school on a Monday, uh, it's often on Wednesday. So these are the key highlights, the PACE framework. You do have to post the PACE framework once you have yours, whether it's the state one or a custom one on your school district website. Implementation needs to begin in CPS uh, by July 21st, 2024. 2024, excuse me, for the 24-25 school year, and in all other districts by the 25-26 school year, July 1st, 2025. Um, so more information will be coming out about that. Then the career pathway endorsements. Um, so here are the requirements on this. Um, all districts need to offer one career pathway endorsement, unless your school board opts out. You need to offer one career pathway, pathway endorsement by 2027. Um, so that's for the 12th graders leaving in 2027. So that means there's no time like the present to get started on that. Um, two by 2029. And three, if your uh, district has an enrollment of 350 or more ninth through 12th graders. So if you're a unit district, uh, the total number of students that that is matters here is only the number of students in ninth through twelfth grade, um, but you have to have three offered by 2031. And so, so now um, it is it is time to move forward with this. And so um, we we are sharing a slide deck that includes these slides and a couple others uh, shortly, hopefully next week, with the EFE directors to share out regionally. Um, so that they can use it with superintendents, assistant superintendents, and then can be used internally for uh, high-level professional development about what's in HB 3296 um, here. So that is what's coming. If there's any questions about that before we hand it over to Heather for the meat of this, 
um, please throw those in the chat. All righty, Heather. Oh, wait, wait, we have a question. Ah, I've been waiting for someone to ask this question. This is a great question. And this is this is perfect fodder for Heather's rulemaking, I suppose. Um, so let me let me explain the question here. So one of the things to note, I'm gonna go all the way back to this slide. So you can have multiple um, multiple ways within each career pathway to earn an endorsement in that career pathway. So different areas of focus within the pathway. So for example, I was at a school district um, over through fall of 2019, very early in this, and they were already planning for their class of 2024, our current 11th graders now who were eighth graders at the time, they were planning two pathways within the IT career pathway. And that there were two sets of course sequences. And one set of course sequences, they shared one course in common, if I remember right. But then one set of course sequences was focused on hardware and networking. And the other set of course sequences was focused on software and computer science and computer programming. And then you would move through your work-based learning experiences and earn your endorsement. So that's an example. Now, the example that Laura put in the chat is an even more clear example um, is so within health sciences and technology, for example, you could have uh, a sequence that focused on nursing, um, maybe centered around the CNA, maybe not. Uh, you could have one focused on sports medicine and athletic training, for example. Um, and, and maybe you have another one focused on nutrition. I'm making that up, but that's a possibility. That could be cool. It could include a culinary class that's focused on nutrition. So the question is, going back to this slide where the requirement is to offer three career pathway endorsements, um, would those three in, in Laura's example, for example, in health sciences and technology, or the two by 2029 in the example of the school district I gave in IT, uh, would those count for, for this? Heather? Wow, that was a loaded one, Jason. Thanks for putting me on the spot with that. <laughs> this is why Heather. This is why Heather gets paid the big big bucks. And if you don't okay, believe that, it, just know, all, just no, know no, no, that no one at Isby gets paid the big bucks. They are truly, truly our uh -huh. servants, our our public servants. So no, this is a very challenging question for Heather. And again, let me just um, preface this to support her by saying the rulemaking process will help this. And we are very early in the rulemaking process. Heather, what right. do you got for us though? So uh, again, thanks, Jason. Um, no, um, as I read this and as I'm looking through um, what the rules will be, I interpret this as that, that question that Laura asked, that would be, that would be no <laughs> for that. So a career pathway endorsement, basically you have seven options. So even though you can specify different plans within that endorsement area, as Jason mentioned, it would have to be a unique endorsement. Um, because even if a student uh, receives the nursing and receives the sports medicine, that's their program that they're following, but it still falls under um, the, the health science technology. So I would say that would be as when I'm starting to look at the rules, I would write that as a, it has to be a unique endorsement separate. And, and again, Heather is saying that, Heather, correct me if I'm wrong here, but that's that's based on what the legislation has given Heather, yeah. Heather to work correct. with here, based on how the legislation has defined this. I see um, just about that question. Um, they are aligned to a SIP so that they do fall under specific programs that we offer. So, Heather, can yeah. you can you explain to those who may not know what a what a zip code is? Because that's really sure. inside baseball education. Sure, speak, so. sure. So a zip code is basically just, well, that's another question because we're we're going through defining all these things as we speak with all these. Um, so zip code, I would look at that as um, a sequence of courses. Um, aligned to a program. So for example, if you have a nursing or the CNA, you have specific courses that 
the state has um, adopted that say that this fulfills the career component for this um, program, the SIP code. And all of our programs, which are in all of our matrices and CTE, they are aligned to these pathway endorsements. So if you go to our website, uh, the ISBE website for CTE and innovation, you can see the different matrices for each of these endorsements. So that's how they fall um, underneath this. So they uh, are I'm going to I'm going to jump uh, in and answer Amanda's question, and then we'll bop back to sure. Gail's. We'll give Heather a chance to uh, to read over Gail's question here. Um, but Amanda, your question is a great question. So first of all, yes, I think that. As we evolve, so this is this is a, a college and career readiness initiative, not necessarily specifically a CTE initiative. initiative. And so um, that means that CTE, of course, would be at the forefront of any college and career readiness initiative. So right now, a lot of the courses have been, have been CTE courses, but yes, you can certainly have a course sequence that's a mix of CTE and core classes or CTE and fine arts classes, that could certainly be the case. I believe we will also increasingly have uh, course sequences that are that just include core courses uh, as the course sequences while the students are getting work-based learning experiences that might be deeply rooted in CTE as well. So um, I think we're gonna see some blending of that. And the examples would be obviously as, as traditional science classes are evolved, involved or, or social science classes where students are looking at things from a policy angle, for example. So an economics or government or political science class is part of a course sequence psychology. Um, these are all places where there's, there's lots of room for, um, for integrated course sequences. There may be actual room uh, as, as some of our CTE leaders know for actual integrated courses as well, um, which is really exciting. Uh, so now let's turn it over to Heather. Gail did okay. put a uh, follow up there right. with a smiley face. Um, okay, Gail, so I know what you're talking about. I shared with her yesterday the crosswalk and that's supposed to be up on the website. So I'm completely redoing the website. They just haven't updated that for me yet. I was really hoping it would be ready to go for today, but it's not. Um, I, yeah, MET has basically, um, so they've taken the, the 16 career clusters and they've broken it down to our seven endorsements. So what Gail's referencing is under MET, there are basically five of the uh, career clusters that, that feed into MET. Um, it wouldn't vary though. I, I think if I'm understanding your question, Gail, it wouldn't vary. It would still be the same. So if, if those one of those five were, were what you're building your plan on, it's still going to be a MET endorsement. I think that's what you're asking. I hope that's what you're asking. And Heather, that's so. what I was trying to ask. So like with the SIP, the hyphenated SIP, like the MET dash engineering, MET dash transportation yeah. or manufacturing, Yes. Those would not be identified as different endorsements then. Correct. That is correct. So the hyphenated is, piece doesn't really make a difference in this case. Hyphenated piece doesn't make any difference except I'm toying with the idea of adding that to the endorsement seal. Um, I've had some requests for that um, at the school level to be able, or the district level, to be able to say they've received, for especially for education, they've received the human public service endorsement slash education. So it shows that specialized program, um, which I think will help when we talk about kind of marketing this and how what this looks like. So you may not understand at all <laughs> what the human and public services or why that would fall in there. Don't really need to know that as long as you know that it's an education focus. So the other, the other thing I want to mm -hmm. call out as being a real source of Heather's success, but that's definitely still in progress is Heather's been doing a lot of work behind the scenes with the ISB team. And we'll, we'll talk about this next when we talk about the application process on the IT side of this, on the data entry side. And there's a lot more work to be done beyond this year. And Heather's got some very clear goals in that space. And um, Joe, to the point of what you're asking about with like the endorsement plus the SIP code potentially, um, some of the technology may offer solutions for that. And so that's not a this year thing. Um, Heather, Heather wishes it was, but it, it's, 
it, she continues to do that work with the team within the agency and everybody's been great about moving that forward. Um, it, it's just obviously there's a lot of priorities always competing for that, that attention of those people. Um, I'm gonna jump in and answer Caleb's question. So Caleb, your question kind of, if I understand it correctly, it comes right off that conversation. The seven pathways, um, I'm gonna say two things. So first, on very simple level, is there a public list of the endorsements uh, pathways that can be shared with schools? This is the list. It is the ag agriculture, food and natural resources, arts and communications, finance and business services, health sciences and technology, human and public services, information technology, manufacturing, engineering, technology, and trade. So those, those are the endorsement areas. Now, with that said, we'll let everybody in on a little secret. Uh, our, our retreat day coming up on Tuesday in normal, we are gonna be, we're very excited to be working with Heather, our NIU team to dive in and we're gonna do an analysis of both the course sequences and the team-based challenges this coming week. And then we may be contacting some of you after we've done that analysis to ask you questions and learn more about what you've done and what you've submitted um, so that we can start putting out some, some examples and exemplars out there to help other people in, in this direction. Um, so, so that kind of work is coming, but essentially the endorsements themselves are, are in the seven pathways. Um, Heather, do you, do you jump in with Terry's question? Or do you want or, me to jump uh, no, in with no, that no. one? No, we're good. Uh, oh, Terry, Terry, yeah. Oh, yes, the core content. Yes, I agree with that. Um, need to be related to the career area. One of the things that I've I've been toying with. Um, so, <laughs> do you know, did you have to have those? Um, you have to reach out to your community colleges or universities to build those partnerships for the dual credit and so forth. So one of the things that I'm looking at potentially is putting into the rules where you can have one of those courses, Jason spoke on this before, um, being one of the, what we call, you know, the core of the science or, or even a math course or, or that, as long as it aligns to what the program requirements are at the community college or university level. And perhaps that comes from an upload that you provide where it shows the, the coursework um, that the student would need to have to get that associate's degree or certificate certificate or, or whatnot um, that would provide evidence of that. But at least one of those courses need to be um, directly related to the career or the program that they're, they're focusing on. So I, I wouldn't allow, I'll just, I'll just be honest, I would not allow you to use an English and a math course as your pathway courses. If you, one of those <laughs> was um, related to the program that you're, you're applying for, then yes, that would be sufficient to do that. As long as, and if I needed more evidence, I would just reach out to you and say, show me, show me where it's saying that this specific math class needs to be for this um, a degree or, or certificate. And, and I just wanna jump in on both Terry's and Cassie's comments. So the requirements are around early college credit and it is defined uh, by, by credit hours, uh, by the equivalent of six hours. And so, so that gets messy, but in terms of like different schools, for example, for advanced placement offering different, different post-secondary institutions offering different amounts of credit for the same score. But it does offer, so that, that early college credit definition allows advanced placement, um, IB, dual credit, all to be examples of ways one can earn early college credit. Where dual credit becomes such the centerpiece of this is because of what Heather was just describing is by ensuring that we're really tying um, that early college credit coursework experience to the pathway, dual credit tends to be the most flexible to do that around these different pathways. Now that's not to say that an AP computer science course couldn't fit very neatly into an information technology um, uh, pathway uh, course sequence, of course it could, but, but dual credit allows you to work with your local community college, for example, and offer coursework in any of these areas. And so, um, so that's, that's what that looks like. Articulation um, agreements are also an option. Uh, that mm -hmm. is a, a mm -hmm. possibility as 
well. So yep. if you have an articulation agreement with your community college that says if the student completes this course, then that will be credited um, towards them or, or, or whatnot. Then I've, I've had that as well within these plans. Uh, Tara, one question, if you could clarify in the chat, is your geometry and construction a dual credit course then? Because they are not necessarily a dual credit course. So I don't want to uh, make an assumption there. So if you can drop that in the chat and then Heather, not at this time. So, so a ge geometry and construction course could certainly count in a course sequence. It wouldn't count as an early college credit course. And again, most my experience with geometry and construction courses where I've worked with with geometry and constructions, they were also not early college credit courses. So, so Tara, I wasn't suggesting that that you were out of line by not having that be the case. So, but it could count as a course in a course sequence, uh, certainly uh, for meeting that two year course sequence requirement around the pathway. Well, a lot of great questions there. And there's a great example from Eric. Thank you, Eric, that their geometry and construction course at Ridgewood is dual credit. Um, again, it can be, and that's gonna, that's gonna impact what geometry is being done in the geometry in construction course actually. And so that's great. Um, Stephanie's asking a question about a new position that our EFE directors are familiar with, but many of the other people in the call may not be. And so, um, Stephanie, if it's okay um, with you, I'm going to defer that question to outside this meeting, knowing that we'll be coming back or the agency will be coming back and defining more about the college and career pathway endorsement coordinators yeah. separately to the EFE directors. So, and, um, and I can tell you, I can, I can say this, Stephanie, that um, I just received as during this meeting, the, the possible dates for our first training. So, um, and that's going to be, it looks like, it looks like the, the first week of October ish is what we're looking at. So. Awesome. So I want to, looking at time, I want to turn it over to Heather. This is the last main part, talking about the application process. So Heather, take it away. Sure. So this is a flow chart that's on the website, um, but I thought that this would just be an easy way to go through this. So if you're new, um, a new district, don't have anything offered, so all these are going at the district level, uh, you would submit an application. The updated application should be on the website soon. Um, it's just it's just tweaking a few of the words on that. But if you were to use the current application that's on there, that would be fine. Um, there's nothing, there's no date on that one at all. Um, like I said, it's just some clarifying language on there. And I think change in who you're submitting it to, because my email is different now. Um, and so then once you submit the application to me, I provide um, access to the online platform where you can start to build your um, your pathway endorsements and your plans. And then once they're approved, if you're ready to issue for the year, you would send in a district projection. So for those districts that already have access to the platform and you're already offering endorsements, you do not have to reapply every year. The only thing you need to do is send in your district projections. And the reason for the district projections, which I tell, I say all the time, you could put down that you have one student that's projected to get something for say health, health, health science technology. And at the end of the year, you send me your list and you have 500 students, that's okay. It could be the opposite as well. You tell me you're gonna have 20 and you don't have any, that's fine. It's just so I can monitor as it stands with the platform now, so that I can monitor who is in the process of going to issue those. Um, and then I can send out an official letter saying that you've been approved for the year and also your seal for that. Um, so once, if, if so that's kind of the process for um, applying and for your responsibility if you're already in the, the platform and you're going to be issuing it, it's just the, the annual report or the district projections that you would send out to me um, at any point during the year. Um, earlier the better, obviously, but again, you may not know until March that, oh my gosh, we have students that are eligible for this now, I'm going to send this off. I'll send you your letter and your seals, and then at the end of the year, you need to submit, um, again, because we don't have this, this you know, access in the, in the platform yet, you would need to submit the names of the students and their student 
uh, ID and the school district that they're issuing or the school that they're getting the endorsement from. And then I send that off to the SIS team so that they can put that information in for the college and career readiness indicators and for any you know, promotional materials that we have on that. Yeah, Heather, I would love to say, I see that question, Anthony. I would love to say it's like within a day or two, but <laughs> as it right now, I'm a little backlogged with that. But my goal is Monday, I have a free day and some of the day on Tuesday, <laughs> some of the day, um, and I can I can get those out if you've sent one in to me. So I have them all. I have a huge binder that has all this because that's the only way for me to monitor it. So um, those will be going out. And then um, through approval, again, that, that will probably be if you put one in and, and you haven't heard back um, on an, an official stamp of approval yet, um, that will be forthcoming as well. Awesome. So just a couple quick things on this. This uh, does evolve, has, and it certainly has evolved since the beginning of the process, and it has evolved based on uh, feedback from, from school districts. And um, thanks so much to the school districts who were early adopters and offered that feedback, and thanks to Heather for not only listening to that feedback, but working through ISB processes. Uh, again, I, I mentioned this earlier. It is a, some of this is based on the fact that this is currently a different data collection system than other ISB systems like ISB SIS and IWAS. Um, and so um, it, it, the big overriding theory is you submit once and then you update the projections annually. And then in the future, you know, the goal is to, to get this into IWAS or, or if the the data and NIT teams it is be determined that that SIS makes more sense, but but ultimately into into a, a regular ISB system, so it can be a, a more routine part of district uploads. Right. Any, anything exactly. to add there, Heather? Yeah, I will say that I've had um, I've had two meetings now with the IT team, um, and we're looking at as soon as possible actually getting this into IWAS. Um, so that as far as access, it would be just the same as if you were going to access one of the applications in IWAS. Um, it would also allow then for that SIS upload to occur, you know, seamlessly. Um, so my next meeting with them is, is literally to, to tell them what they need on each page. So I can't tell you when that will happen, or <laughs> um, but um, I, I tell them all the time, I get more and more applications and it's more and more challenging to monitor everything and to be able to run reports, which I can't do and, and so forth. So um, we're pushing that. If you already have plans in the system now, it will be transferred over to the application. So it's not like you'll have to apply again or, or you lose your data, so. Amazing. Well, thanks for your work on that. Um, and again, you can find these resources on the College and Career Pathway Endorsement website, um, which is in the College and Career Readiness section. You can get there um, by just searching College and Career Pathway Endorsement on the ASB website. Have, yeah, that's going to have a new look. We're going to, I'm adding more graphics if I can to it, <laughs> or at least links to more graphics. I mean, that tends to be what they like to have. Um, the updated application will be there. Um, I, I do know that on the application, what I've added um, for this year and on ongoing um, is the ability um, for you to be able to identify additional users that need access to the platform. Uh, keep in mind that if you get access to the platform and you try to add or invite someone on your own, it will not work and they won't, they will not be able to be added and I'll have to go in and kind of erase them and then send an invite um, from my own, um, yeah, template. So <laughs> just so you know, and I try to put that in the email out to everyone once they get access is if you need somebody else added, please let me know and then I can, I can send them an invite. So but that can and, be updated. I'm hoping that'll be updated by Monday. I'm hoping <laughs> I put the request in. So, uh, one other call out here, and that is that um, one of the things Heather started offering last year was office hours uh, to answer specific district level questions uh, about the college and career pathway endorsements and the processes related to that. And so you can see those are listed on this page. Heather has kept up with that and those have been very, very well received 
And so while we're happy to, um, while we're happy to offer all kinds of training and support, um, office hours is kind of that tier three support uh, way to get your individual questions answered. And so please, we encourage you to take advantage of that um, when you have those questions and um, go directly to Heather. And again, she's, she's also keeping track of those. Um, and, um, I will say, Chris, you can go ahead and submit your application. That's some of the language that I changed on that. You do not have to have, um, you do not need to submit your district projections. In, in fact, think of it as just the application is, is used to gain access to the platform. And even if you're years out, you can still get access to the platform and, and go in there and start to build things and, and see what requirements are needed. And then once you're ready to go, then you hit that submit button and, <laughs> and then we'll go from there. So you can even have a plan approved and not issue any um, endorsement. So if you have it approved, that's great. And it just sits there basically until you send me the district projection. And then I know, okay, they're gonna be you know, offering something this year. And I, I wanna jump on that last comment Heather made. I mean, in, in my own career as an administrator and thinking through this, both having worked at the middle school level and at the high school level, if it were me, I would want to get our endorsement plans approved as early as we're ready to get those approved. I want to be talking about those at the latest, beginning with eighth grade student and parent kind of orientation things to high school and getting kids excited about those experiences. And certainly right now, I may, I may get ones approved that I already have students this year or next year who will who will be able to earn. I'm not going to prevent those kids from earning endorsements, but as I'm also planning out and, and building stuff out, I, I want to do that long term so we can be we can be building a culture around that in our school communities and, and getting kids excited about that. So Chris, I think that's a, a perfect example. Um, so so yeah, Amanda, there are there are dozens of school districts and we can connect you with somebody. We can do that offline separately for one of the many school districts that has gotten an approved endorsement and had students uh, walk across the stage, if you will, with their health sciences and technology. You can also throw that question out via email to the group. Um, so with that said, because um, we have lots of people on here who have students who have earned endorsements who can help you. And that's the exact point of the group. So Amanda, thank you so much for asking. Uh, we'll also follow up. So we have dropped an evaluation into the chat. Um, we need your evaluations from these sessions. Again, we, we know we dumped a lot of information on people today as we restarted. We had a law passed since the end of last school year. Uh, there was a lot to kind of go over and get out there. Uh, we will be tapping people on the shoulder and asking people to share things that we know they have answers to. If you have something you want to share with the group, please don't be shy about reaching out to Bill and Heather and myself and saying, hey, I'd love to share this at a monthly meeting. Um, but we also know that making that, that email user group, the Google group come alive is a really important part of this. And so please, please, please share your thoughts there. But we're also looking to the Jamboard today and the evaluations from today for direction on where we go. So please take just a minute to, to complete that evaluation. Um, and then there is the email address that you would send an email to if you wanna pose it to the user group. And I think that that is not the right date in October. And so I'm gonna double check that and fix the slide if it is incorrect uh, while you are completing the evaluation. Um, thanks so much. Yeah, it is October 14th, which is I thought what I had typed. Thanks again to everybody for joining us today. And um, and yeah, please complete. Yeah, thank the you.